Matt is from Orlando, Florida. He's, he uh, worked for Tribune, uh, developing um, products and strategies for them in the digital world. So he's got a lot of experience with this. So thank you. Thanks, Randy. Um, I, I, I've got, right. I've got okay. I think she wants the mic back. Um, I'll just keep this and keep talking to uh, Amanda while we see. So, uh, you know, my, my, my quick disclaimer is uh, that while I was at uh, the Tribune Company and worked with our eight newspapers there on the digital strategy, uh, I was actually on the team uh, of people that was against setting up a paywall. And so, uh, the, the other part of, that, part of that is that I'm not fully on board with, with the paid content model. So I think that it puts me in a, in, a, in a unique position to be actually helping newspapers with their strategy, um, but actually being skeptical about whether or not that is 100% uh, of the best, the best strategy they should be going after. And, and so that's an ongoing debate that we've, we've been having over the past uh, number of years, but specifically here within the past uh, five to ten years, it's been a, a, a resurgence in it. And so today, uh, instead of focusing on whether or not they should or shouldn't, uh, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about you know, what, where, where we are within the paid content space for local news, what does the, the, the space look like, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what does it mean when a, a newspaper is building a paid content model, uh, what are the things they should be thinking about, uh, and then third, we'll look at from a marketing perspective. Okay, so we know where we're at, we know what they need to do to build, uh, but the third piece, I think, and the, and the weakest piece right now in our industry is marketing uh, the paid content model, and that's really what my project focuses on, but I think the other two pieces are important to walk through. Um, to begin with, I think we've got to start with really what is paid content just to make sure we're all on the same page here. And, and uh, when we talk about paid content specifically for local news, we're talking about charging access to view content. Um, now, we've been doing that since, since the beginning for, for, for newspapers, whether that was uh, you know, charging for select access. The New York Times for the longest time has been experimenting with uh, New York Times Select and different opportunities of, okay, if we segment this type of content off, we charge this rate. Um, but really, we haven't seen local newspapers take a, a huge dive into it until recently. Um, and the main reason uh, that they've done that is because they need revenue. And so we're going to talk a little about why the, the, the move to paid content is really about an immediate need. I mentioned that, that lots of, of newspapers are doing it. Uh, in 2012, in the publisher uh, uh, survey that, that Mike does, uh, found that 53% you know, were still free. Uh, the rest were charging pay, uh, for access. Uh, this was huge uh, because we really had no sense of where we were in the industry. And so that gave us a good viewpoint of, okay, what papers, who are they, um, and are they charging for content? Uh, the, the really interesting thing, and, and I know Mike's working on a follow-up, is you know, when we start looking at where we're at today, uh, we've crossed that 50% threshold. And we know that because there are a number of papers that said no, but we're launching by January. No, but we're launching in December. And so when we start calculating those papers in, we've actually crossed the threshold. And so to me, this isn't, this, we still need to de debate whether this is a great strategy, um, but at the end of the day, newspapers are doing it. Um, and so if we can take the newspapers, the, the more than 50%, and help them be successful, make them successful, um, we'll get the other 40-something uh, percent on board, or maybe next year it'll be only 30%. Um, but I don't think that we spend a, this much time in the industry deciding if this is a good strategy uh, when people are already doing it. I think we need to spend time focusing on how to make it a successful strategy. So who are these papers? Well, uh, the most interesting piece is that they're, they're, they're uh, being led by small papers. And so the other thing Mike asked was based on circulation. So you can see here that newspapers who have smaller circulations are actually more likely right now uh, to have a paid content model. And there are a variety of reasons why. Uh, I think the biggest reason it has to do with competition, right? So the smaller the newspaper, the smaller the town, the less likely they are to have a di another digital competitor that offers similar kind of content for free. So if you're in a small town, the TV station, even if there's a TV station that covers your area, they're really not covering that spe specific community. Um, and so that really allows these papers that have unique content to go in and charge and, and possibly in the end be, be slightly more successful at it. Um, we, we know that most of the major newspaper groups, here's a list of, uh, that I'm sure as of yesterday is probably out of date because there's always more that are jumping on board. But we know that the newspaper groups, these, these large groups, are, are charging for content. Some of them experimenting, um, but uh, most of them are in at an all-in. So part of the, the paid content is, is setting a meter. And so there are a variety of different ways that they can do that. They can say, you know what, no matter what you have to pay. Right? You want to look at any content, you're going to have to pay for access. Uh, but what we're seeing is the most, likely, most, uh, the most popular scenario is, is some sort of metered access where they say, okay, we're going to put a certain type of content behind the paywall, and then we're going to count. So you can get X amount for free. So we're going to put all of our content maybe behind the paywall, and you can get 10 for free, or 5 for free, or 12 for free a month. 
And so usually it's, a, even though we say a month, it's really a rolling 30-day period. The details of that vary, but when you start looking at where they're at, you can see them coalescing around the easy numbers, uh, 5, 10, and 15. Um, I think that these are going to start shifting uh, more and more. Um, I think we'll see a shift down as we see newspapers move from the higher numbers to the lower numbers. Uh, I left in here um, 60. And, and I don't know, and I actually have to talk to Mike a little about this, but I, I'm going to guess that that newspaper was not at 60. Um, I'm going to guess that the publisher was in that incorrect with what they said. And the reason I left that in there is because one of the most striking things when reading through the responses from publishers were the number of publishers that did not know where their paywall meter was set at. Um, and I think that's scary uh, from an industry perspective. If we believe that this is the future and the future revenue model for us digitally to have publishers that uh, don't know or are unaware of what their, their paid content model is. Um, so I think that'll start changing uh, over the year because you can imagine that if you ask a publisher uh, how much of their singer copy rate uh, they'd be able to tell you, I think that knowing where their paywall is is just as important. So this is where we're at, but the question is, is it a success? Um, I think it depends on, on, on how you define success in this area. So we see a small percentage of active online users are now subscribers. And so we know that they're not losing revenue, right? So even though there might be a page you dip, uh, we know that that's easily made up for in the subscriber revenue. You can shift some of the ad inventory around. Most newspapers are selling on average about 50% of their online ad inventory, so losing a percentage of inventory isn't that harmful to them. So most papers are walking away from this saying it's a success because, hey, we've, we've increased our subscribers and, and there's revenue increase. Um, my problem is that we haven't changed the, the understanding with consumers. So one of the big reasons, that there are two reasons that, that newspapers do paywalls. Um, one is that immediate, immediate revenue hit to get more print subscribers. They're okay with digital only, but most of them want those print subscribers that will say, you know what, it's only 25 cents more for between digital and Sunday plus digital. I'll go to Sunday plus digital. Now they get another Sunday subscriber. And so this is the, 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 the messaging behind what they're doing. And that's great. Um, they need those print subscribers. Um, the other piece is they want to change the conversation around digital access. So they want people to perceive the value online when they access content. And so if, if, the, if that's the goal, I don't know that we're there yet. I think that as, as newspapers are charging and you're getting people to, to the 7 plus uh, digital, you know, or the Sunday plus digital, even though people may have started with the mindset of, oh, okay, I'll buy a digital subscription because I have to, I keep hitting this paywall, when they get the Sunday paper, their view is not every month that they're paying or every week, depending on how they're doing the billing, that they're paying for digital and they're paying for the Sunday paper. After a couple of weeks, their mindset is, I'm paying for the Sunday paper and I'm getting access to digital for free. So we, we, we don't have that uh, from, from a psychological standpoint. The person is not paying for digital. And so we really haven't gotten to that point with a lot of these newspapers where people are actually paying for digital um, that is changing that, that mindset. And so part of that is marketing. Part of that is how they're selling it and that their goal is to increase print subscribers for the, for the immediate term. Um, and, and it's just a conversation that we've got to work on. And so I believe that, that the, 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 the big piece of that is we've got to build a product. Um, what I mean by that is when we, we, we launch our subscription models in the news industry, we tend to say, okay, yesterday it was free, today it's $5.99, and that's a product. Um, and if you think about what we would do if we were at Procter & Gamble. So, you know, Procter & Gamble is really known for their their, their digital, uh, or for their, their, their product managers and, and for the great products they're able to build, um, they wouldn't look at it as, oh, you know what, we're just going to take our existing product that was the web that was print and we're going to now charge people the same way we've always done for print, we'll do it online. No, instead they'd sit down and they'd build out a product plan, they'd come up with, okay, who's our target demographic? What problems are we solving? What are the unique features for that demographic that we're going to go after? What kind of you know, penetration are we going to see in the marketplace? And while we're asking a lot of those questions, maybe from an economic perspective, we tend to not ask those questions in the news industry from a product perspective. Um, and so I think we've got to take a step back and understand it from a product. And so instead of, I don't want to spend too much time talking about building a product because that could be a whole three-day seminar on, on building digital products. Instead, we'll look at the paywall. And so when we talk about the paywall, the big product question is, what's behind the paywall? What's in front of the paywall? And so I'll share with you a couple of in, uh, interesting statistics that, that, that uh, Mike found out in, in, in his survey. 70% um, of the sites surveyed uh, are putting breaking news and wire stories behind the paywall. And that to me is striking because we should only put behind the paywall what people are willing to pay for, right? And so breaking news and wire stories in most situations are available 
on other sites. Wire story is definitely breaking news. It depends on the market. Some of these markets, again, smaller newspapers, smaller communities, they don't have that TV station competitor. They may be able to do that. But for a lot of these papers, the breaking news, wire stories, that's what I consider to be commodity content. It's available everywhere. You can get it easily. It's not something that people are, are really willing to pay for. The other interesting one was that less than 15% were charging for their mobile products. Now, I, I have a feeling that a lot of that has to do with some of them don't have mobile products, they don't have good mobile products, they don't have an ability to charge for mobile products, so there's a, a lot of other factors that play into that. But the reason it's interesting is because we know that people, again, from a psychological perspective, are more and more used to paying for things on their mobile devices. Uh, thanks to Apple, thanks to Google, they're very in the, in, in the habit of understanding that you pay, you pay for games, you pay for music, you're paying all these things that the, the mindset is different for people online. And I fear that if newspapers wait too long, to charge for content on mobile, we're going to be in the exact same situation we are in the desktop where we're trying to change that conversation around payment. Um, so I think the, those two were, were, were very interesting. So the, the other thing that, that newspapers have to, have to you know, really rethink is uh, what, what, they're, what they're building so, or, or what their mindset is in the newsroom. So when I was at the Tribune Company, almost all of our newsroom compensated financially our newsroom managers based on page views, based on unique visitors. And that was great because at that point our mindset was we're selling ads to make a business. The more people we get to our site, the more pages they look at, the more ads we can sell, the more money we make. That's what we need to be doing. Well, the question is, is it the right people? Is it the right content? Um, so we have to, we have to begin a, a brand new analysis of content within our newspapers that is different from what was before. Before we'd look at what gets local people to our website. And that was all that mattered. But, now what matters is what gets local people, or even not local people, to our website who are willing to pay for a subscription. And so that's a completely different conversation. And that means our newsroom goals have to change. Um, we can't keep compensating people within our newsroom. We can't be setting goals within our newsrooms that are just based on raising page views. Um, and then we've got to look at what are these new franchises and brands that we can build as a newspaper or as a news organization that will do well with the right type of people that will drive them to purchase a subscri subscription. So to help do that, um, we've come up with what we're calling a paid content matrix. And so on this matrix, um, over here on, on the, on the left-hand side, we have the uniqueness of the content, right? So the question is, is it premium content you can't get anywhere else, the only place to get it, is that our newspaper and that's it? Or is it commodity content and really put the word in Google and you know, 10 places are going to come up immediately that are offering that same type of content? Or, again, in the eyes of the consumer, the same type of content. Even though we may think it's different, does the consumer see it as unique? And then how interested are people in it, right? So is it something that, who cares, no one's looking at, or, hey, this is something that really lots of people within our community are interested in. And so what we you know, think the, the right way to do is to start mapping it out and to say, okay, and this is not a, a specific newspaper, this is not what I think all newspapers, it's not, any, it, this is just a representative example. So in this case, we've got two columnists, uh, one that's popular, one that isn't popular. Um, both are fairly unique. The one that's popular is, has a higher perception of its uniqueness. Our local in-depth coverage, it's, it's fairly unique. You really can't get local in-depth coverage, even from a TV station in the area. Um, they're just not able to provide it. Uh, TV listings, you can get it anywhere. And honestly, people aren't coming to our website anymore for it. Um, photo galleries, lots of people on our website love them. But guess what? You can get photo galleries of poorly parked cars, of horribly dressed people, of old people, plastic surgery gone wrong, whatever the photo galleries are, even if they're local, um, you can get them anywhere. Um, and it's really not necessarily premium and unique content. So we start mapping that out and you can start to see you know, how a, the, an entire site would fall into this. And, and the idea here is that you're getting an understanding of what type of content are people willing to pay for. And obviously the interest is easy to measure, right? We have page views, we've got unique visitors. The uniqueness of the content can also be easily measured by putting up a paywall and seeing what people convert on. So if you reach a paywall and it's on breaking news and you don't subscribe, then we know you didn't place value on that. So we can take a look at what people are actually converting on. In other words, when do they actually subscribe to the content? So, hey, look at that. On all of our local coverage, that's when people end up subscribing. That's what they find unique. That's what they're willing to pay for. That's what we need to produce more of. On our photo galleries, we all know no one's subscribing to look at a photo gallery of, of, of horribly dressed people. It just doesn't happen. I shouldn't say no. I'm sure there are people out there, but very few people are willing to do that. So we can look at, at the subscription rates by content type. You could even do it by uh, journalist. You could do it by uh, different categories. You could do it by community, if you're covering different communities, and see what communities are uh, coverage uh, do people 
more willing to subscribe. And so this can help to frame the thinking. Shouldn't be the only piece of, of the decision making. Obviously, logic needs to play into it too. Um, but it can help frame the thinking of what should be behind the paywall and what shouldn't be. So uh, to help illustrate that a little bit more, let's talk a little bit about some examples. And I'm not a huge fan of looking at examples from within the newspaper industry. Not that we can't learn from uh, from other folks, but I think that uh, sometimes we're, we're a little slow to, to, to get on board with what a lot of folks are. So instead, I want to look at some examples from outside uh, of the industry that are still content, still subscription based. Uh, the first one is SiriusXM. Hopefully, everyone's familiar with uh, SiriusXM. But SiriusXM had a very interesting problem. They wanted to charge people for content, radio content, that was already available for free. I mean, think about it, right? You could turn on your radio, get as much free radio as you want, listen as long as you want, and not pay a dime for it. Sure, there are commercials, but that's a minor inconvenience when you consider how much Sirius XM wants to charge you for the content. And so they had a challenge ahead of them. And so how did they, de how did they do it? Well, first thing is, they have a paywall at zero, right? You can't go and listen nine hours free a month, right? They could do that. The technology is there. It's definitely possible. But Sirius chose not to do that they realized that the way that they wanted to get people in the door was through free trials. So they run three months, six month free trials with manufacturers. That's actually a huge cost for them. They actually pay the manufacturer, GM and Ford, get money every time they get a subscriber to sign up. Even though it's only for a free trial, they're not getting any credit card, they're not getting any money out of it, they pay Ford, they pay the dealership money just to get that subscriber. Why? Because they understand that giving someone access for three months, six months, they've tried different ones, gets them hooked and they're more likely to actually convert to a paid subscriber when the paywall at zero hits. The other big thing they did was they said, you know, we can't just offer radio. And they tried that at the beginning. They said, we can't just offer music. We have to have brands. We have to have premium content. We have to have exclusive content. And so Howard Stern, Oprah, they've developed programming specific for SiriusXM to get people hooked. And the only place you can listen to that programming is on SiriusXM. Um, they have very little content, very little content that is available both on SiriusXM and off. And the content that is, is things like MSNBC and CNN, uh, which guess what, you can't get that on your radio as it is. So they're really not, there's very little overlap on those premium brands. Um, the other thing they had to do is they said, well, we still know that radio is still music, which is a commodity content, but we're gonna offer something different, right? And their benefit is two things. One, you don't have to listen to commercials, which is valuable. And two, we're gonna offer you over 120 different channels of, of, of radio, of, of music. So they offered a variety. So they figured those two were the pieces that they offered that was premium. And so they were able to do that. They've got tiered pricing in place and aggressive marketing. Um, an interesting bit, and we'll talk a little bit about marketing spend, um, but Sirius is actually, at the beginning, was spending almost $200 to get a subscriber. So they were spending out of pocket $200 just to get someone to sign up for a subs subscription. Not the free trial, but the actual, even if it was only at $4.95 a month to begin with, that was what they're paying. Now they're down to around 25 to 50, depending on, uh, on who you ask. But that's important because to them it was about going out and marketing. They would call you, call you, call you, send you notices in the mail, give you f trial offers, give you different things. You know, they were really aggressive at getting people to sign up because they understood that once they get someone to sign up, uh, they'll continue to, to stay hooked. And that was all about understanding their lifetime value of a subscriber, how much a subscriber is worth to them. The other example I want to look at is Hulu. Another example is Hulu Plus. Um, so Hulu Plus is the paid version of Hulu. Um, a unique situation in that there's a free version of Hulu. So here they are, they know they've got to offer all these shows for free. Um, they've got some weird situations with their contracts with networks, but at the end of the day, they wanted to charge people for access to view TV online, because they believe that, was the, that is the future for, for online uh, entertainment programming. And so what they've done uh, is they've built a product that is very, very show and brand specific. All of their marketing, almost all of their marketing, is about the specific show that you can watch. Um, why? Because they know that there are certain shows that are premium shows that have a great following, and they can tell people you can watch all the episodes, unlimited, on Hulu Plus. The other piece is that you can get, you know, they, they knew that you could get the other sites for free, so they had to offer something unique. Um, so it was the entire season, all devices. If you want to watch it on your iPad, you want to watch it on your Apple TV, you have to go through Hulu. You can't just without plugging things in and doing your own thing. In theory, you, you know, if you want the Hulu app on your, on your Apple TV or on the Roku box and you want to watch TV, you have to pay for a subscription. So they understood where their value was. And you can actually kind of 
and their original programming that they're starting. So you can actually kind of mark it up in the same way. Their premium content was their original programming. Um, the devices, the fact that they offer all episodes, um, you know, HD, probably not, uh, you know, yes, it, you can only get it through them, but you can really get the HD on a lot of their websites. Recent episodes you can get on the network website, that wasn't their unique value. So they, they're pushing that. Now, their big push, and you could do the same thing for Netflix, and we won't walk through because it's actually very similar, but both of them are getting into original programming. Now, right now, the demand for original programming, especially for Hulu, is not tremendous. Um, their goal is to take that original programming and shift it as far to the right as possible because that's what they realize there is, is going to get people hooked and get them staying. Uh, Netflix, actually, when I first built this presentation, you know, they had, they had launched their House of Cards programming. Um, the numbers on the percentage of subscribers that said that that would make them continue to subscribe was tremendously high because they understand that once you get hooked on a show, you're going to keep coming back for more. And even when the show ends, there'll be another show, and they're going to, they want to be the HBO of, of digital and be offering that, that unique programming. So again, we're in another situation where both these players know that the unique programming is what drives it. Um, the third example, and we'll just do it quickly, is Consumer Reports. Um, I was shocked because I thought that Consumer Reports you had to always pay for. Uh, if you wanted anything online from Consumer Reports, you had to be a subscriber. Um, it's actually not the case. Instead, uh, their expert reviews and consumer news are offered for free. Why? Because you can get it anywhere else. So again, we're in a situation where while Consumer Reports has had a legacy product, their magazine product that sells well and they charge a lot for and they give you memberships and you can get the access online, the news and expert reviews are free if you want the ratings guide, you know, the official like here's all of the uh, appliances, here's all of the autos. Uh, you have to pay for that, but when a new car comes out and their expert reviewer goes out and drives it around, they'll give you most of that review for free, not necessarily the, 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 bullet, the their, you know, circles of, of what it scored in each one. Um, and so again, you've got a case here where they understand their ratings guide, tremendously premium, lots of people are interested in it, you can't get it anywhere else, no one else spends the time to do all of the automakers, all of the appliances, that's going to go well, well into the paywall, but the rest of it, well, you can get consumer news and who released what and if there's a recall and all that information. Uh, it's widely available, so they don't put that behind the paywall. And so I think, again, it's about making those smart decisions. We could sit here for hours and hours and go through all sorts of different sites, um, but I think newspapers have to think, uh, not that just because these sites are doing it, we should do it too, but that these sites have been doing it for a long, much longer time than we have. Um, they've also spent a lot more money than we have on marketing, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, they get it. They know what works. Some of them will fail, some of them won't work, but so will some newspapers who try to do pay paywall content. So m I, I was you know, speaking at this key executive conference, and I, and I actually believe that the best way to figure out what works is to ask people uh, in a newsroom or in an organization, hey, do me a favor, pull out last month's credit card statement and go down the list and find me all of those reoccurring charges that you had completely forgotten about. Because we all have them, whether it's Sirius, whether it's Netflix, whether it's Hulu, whether it's Angie's List. I had actually completely forgotten that I had an Angie's List membership until I was putting this presentation together and remembered, oh, I forgot to cancel that. They bill me every year for $60 or whatever it is, and I continue to pay for it. Clearly, they've got something there, and it works, um, right? So what are, these, what are these folks doing? What works? Those are the ones that we should start using uh, as models, along with other newspapers. <coughs> so that, that last piece is, okay, now that we've built it, how do we market it? And I want to put up a, a, a quote from uh, Netflix CEO, uh, Reed Hastings. And, and uh, Netflix, you know, for those that don't know, is the, provides unlimited movie streaming. And in this quote, he talks about uh, how their main marketing is through viral marketing, essentially. The idea that a friend will tell a friend about Netflix, and that's how they find out about it, and that's why they sign up. Um, and so you'd think, well, okay, that's their main marketing message. This is actually from uh, uh, one of their investor relations calls that he, he, he talked about this. And so if that's their main marketing message, then they probably don't spend a lot of money on marketing, right? I mean, that, you know, this is what he's saying they do, and that's, this is him justifying, by the way, from a question of why don't you spend more money on marketing. Well, in 2013, oops, Netflix spent uh, almost half a billion dollars on marketing. They spent 13% of their revenue on marketing. Now, that's the lowest, one of the lowest in the categories of digital subscriptions and digital uh, content offerings, because most are around 20 to 25%. Guess where newspapers are at when we look at their revenue and what percent they're spending on marketing? About 1%, maybe 2%. So if newspapers want to be successful and want to have a digital paid content product, it's going to take marketing. Even from someone like Netflix, who I bet you almost everyone in this room had heard of Netflix as of last year, they still spent that much money on marketing because they understand they've got to drive people to purchase. And so that's what we're, 
we're, our goal is to help them with that. So I want to take a look at you know, kind of some best practices of, of what uh, newspapers can do. The first here that's an interesting one is from the Chicago Tribune that is actually rolling out now to all of the Tribune properties, uh, which should give you a sense of its success because, as a matter of fact, the other properties that didn't roll it out are reversing what they did in rolling this out. And so they offer three levels of membership. Uh, essentially, there's a, a free, I won't even call it a member, but there's a free you know, subscriber. You come there, you visit, you click on an, on an article, you can read it. The second you click on it, it varies by site, but let's say you know, more than five premium articles, you have to register. You don't have to pay anything, you just have to provide your email address and a password. If you look at more than 10 of pre the premium content a month, then you have to pay. And so what they've done is they've actually built a funnel within the user activity to drive to paid subscriptions. And the key piece of that is that they're getting email, right? They're getting the email address of someone who's interested in five articles. And so, first of all, if you can't get the email address to look at an article, then that's probably not someone that was going to subscribe anyway. So what they've done is they've built a way that for the longest time they're able to draw, get all these emails of people who are likely to purchase a subscription. I mean, think about this. This is someone who read more than five articles a month at the very least. Maybe they clicked on the 10th, ten, but couldn't because they hit the paywall, but didn't buy. And so now they can go after, with email marketing, email newsletters, a variety of different factors, actually move those people in that five model, in that what they call digital light, into digital paid. Um, that's the kind of marketing that we know works, is being able to drive people down into a funnel. So the other funnel that we can kind of look at, and again, when newspapers start offering digital subscriptions, they're e-commerce sites. And so this is a, a, a typical e-commerce uh, funnel for an e-commerce website. And so we have people who are in the local market, and what are we going to do? We're going to brand our product to them to drive them to the website, right? That's our goal. We want to be branding our site, prospecting, getting people to the website. Once they're at the site, we want them to be aware of our digital product, which will drive them to a landing page. Once they're at that landing page, we want them to begin to consider to purchase our product, and that'll drive them through to the checkout process. And at the checkout process, we want to drive intent and drive them to actually purchase the product. And so we want to be monitoring this funnel. We want to be marketing throughout the funnel. So I'm going to skip, if you will, if you allow me for a second, we're going to skip branding, uh, mainly because that's something that newspapers have been doing, TV stations do, uh, agencies do. It's, it's a well-known activity of how we can brand in a marketplace. But let's, let's, let's jump into driving awareness uh, within the site. So again, our goal here is to drive to a landing page and promote the membership. So the, the pieces that we want to do here uh, are we want to drive people to the landing page, and the way to do that is by promoting the membership model promoting members, and promoting content behind the paywall. The number one way we know to drive people, especially today and what most newspapers are doing, is the more people we get to look at content that's behind the paywall, the more likely they are to hit the paywall, the more likely they are to actually purchase. And we know that works. But the other pieces are house ads. Uh, the other piece is going to be you know, this great example. I think this one is from Jacksonville. Uh, identifying which content is, is premium content. Um, letting people know, hey, look, you're missing out on all of this by not being a member. Here's the unique content we offer. Um, New York Times running, running house ads. Um, and then promoting members. So when you have comments on a page, making sure the newspaper, if, if you allow commenters who are non-members to comment, are you giving any benefit to members? Um, do they get identified as a member? Uh, are their posts showing up higher? What are the different things that, that members get that is visible? So not only is it a benefit to the member, but it's actually visible to non-members and wants them to subscribe. And, and, and ads. Um, so people who visit the site, and this is actually what we're, we're building out our, our acquisition platform right now to do, is to take people who visit the site, but maybe don't go to the landing page, maybe don't end up purchasing a subscription, and actually convince them using ads on other websites to end up purchasing. Uh, again, we know from an e-commerce perspective this works. Uh, we know that we can drive people using advertising to come back and actually purchase a subscription. The next level is consideration. Um, this is my favorite, right? Because We've gotten someone to the landing page. All we have to do is get them to begin the checkout process. This is where we see the highest drop off, right? Uh, people hit the paywall, they come to the landing page, and I'm not paying six bucks, I'm not paying 20 bucks, forget this, let me go away. So this is where the biggest optimization opportunity is, um, but to me it's also the most fun. Why? Because it's like having a retail store. It's like someone walking in the store and saying, yeah, I was thinking about buying a shirt today. And all you have to do as the owner of that retail store is convince them that they should buy that shirt and the shirt they should buy is yours. They're in the store. They're interested. We know that. They were looking at that content. You've got it. They want it. All you've got to do is essentially negotiate with them and get them to buy, right? That's what we have to do here. And so uh, wh what are we going to do to, to, to help that? Well, the biggest piece is optimizing the landing page. Optimizing the landing page again. 
we want to spend time and time looking at the page, what drives people, what doesn't. Um, and again, online display remarking. So let's talk about landing page optimization. I've got a couple up here. Uh, the first, and especially for what, what newspapers are doing, we want to tease the content, right? So we want to give them a snippet of the content that gets them excited about what they were about to read. Because if they hit a paywall, we know they were looking for this article, they want to read it, all they got to do is start paying for it. So we want to tease it. And now the biggest problem is when we say tease content in the newspaper industry online, for some reason we think that means show them the first paragraph. I don't know if you've read some local stories in a while, but sometimes the first paragraph is not very enticing. Um, we want to actually remind people, what, what are you going to get if you, if you read this article? What's the benefit? Are you going to find out about the new development that's going in? Are you going to find out about the impact of something happening in your community? Uh, what is the benefit of reading the article? And so we're seeing some newspapers experimenting with that in their content management system of having a special tease area that they can write uh, teases for. Uh, Consumer Reports does a great job, but again, they've got a limited set of content, so they can spend hours and hours of marketing people writing that tease content. Um, here's Arkansas Online is actually providing the tease on this landing page that you can see has their different options. It's not, oh, you were on a page, and now, by the way, you can purchase. It's, remember, this is what you are trying to look at. All you got to do is drive through. Um, we also want to clearly explain the benefits. Um, we love saying all access. You get all access to all of our content. What content? What does that mean? We want to remind people why it is that they're coming here, what it is that they have that we, that, that we have that they want. Um, another great one is the sign-up form. And uh, you, you can see here how, how high up uh, they've placed their subscribe now. So many newspaper websites. Article preview, member sign-in, member benefits, subscribe. That's what we want them to click on. We want to move it up top. Um, Sign-ins, people know upper left hand, upper, upper right hand corner of the page, that's where they can sign in. That's a no-brainer. We don't need to put that nice and big in waste marketing space. We want to remove navigation or any distractions. So you'll notice here again, Arkansas Consumer Reports still has navigation on this page. The next one's gone. The other two, uh, no navigation. Why? We don't want to distract them. Somebody, again, is in your store. Stop trying to get them to, to browse other things. Get them to purchase, and that's what we're looking to do. And then the final piece is we want to A-B test everything. Um, there's really cheap websites out there that let you A-B test different landing pages, different creative, different messaging. Maybe it's not subscribe now, maybe it's join now, maybe it's learn more. What are the call to actions that work? Does it make more sense if there's a, three people in your community outside, you know, in the downtown area, you know, looking like they're reading a computer, or does it help to have a newspaper there as the image? What are the images that really drive people into it? Um, we want to test all of that one at a time to figure out what works best. So now we've got them into the checkout process. They're ready to purchase. But you wouldn't believe how many per people start the checkout process but don't complete. Um, and there are a variety of reasons to that. So our goal here is to get them to actually purchase. And the number one reason they don't purchase on a checkout form is because it takes too long. We know that the more pages you have, the more information you're asking for, the less likely it is that someone will subscribe. And it might be something simple. Right now, when you go to almost every single newspaper website and click subscribe, do you know what the next thing you see is? please give us your zip code. Most people don't understand why when they're clicking on a digital access, they're getting, being asked for their zip code information. The reason is because we're going to try and sell them the paper and we need to know where they live in order to make them an offer on the paper because of, of our print subscription rates. But the reality is that's not what the consumer expects. We want to keep things as simple as possible. And um, you know, I, I told the, the, the executives at this conference they should go home and actually try to purchase a subscription on their website um, because you would not believe how difficult it is made on some of these sites to actually purchase a sub subscription. About three to four pages is what we know works uh, to actually get someone to subscribe is the optimal. Uh, the first thing we want to always try and do as quickly as possible is capture their email address because if they don't finish the registration process, we've got their email address now and we can send them an email. Here's what Hulu sent me. 24 hours after I did not subscribe, but I gave them my email address. Um, and the subject line was something to the effect of, did we do something wrong? Um, because they know that that is a great way to get people back in. Netflix waited, I think it was like a week to two weeks to send me an email follow-up to say, hey, you didn't complete your registration. Don't forget, you can still get a one-week free trial. And we want to test and track those things. Again, because maybe it's, you know, Netflix decided it was two weeks, Hulu decided it was a day, who knows what it'll be for a given newspaper. But testing and tracking all the different types of, of remarketing and, and cart abandonment uh, is what we call it, uh, will, will help. And so we want to send those uh, follow-up emails and we want to, again, market to anyone who's gone onto this page but did not purchase. The, the, the last piece, so now I want to kind of jump back up top because if we've done all of that right, 
there's something really cool we can do. And essentially, we can drive people who've never even visited our site to subscribe. Why? Because we know who subscribes. And what ends up happening in digital marketing is we can start building out behavioral profiles, demographic profiles of people who subscribe to a given type of content and go out and market to them. So we can actually find someone in the community who maybe doesn't visit the website on a regular basis, but is actually would be interested in purchasing. We know that based on the sites they visit, based on the things they do online, and we can actually use behavioral targeting, site targeting to actually go after those folks. So we, we call that smart prospecting. It's going after new people based on the fact that they look like the people that we see subscribing. A little bit more expensive, but it still can be within the range of, of what, we, what we need to pay for a new subscriber. And again, we're tracking everything to see what works. The other great thing we can do, and this is, this is fun because it's something that, that can be done very easily, is to find out the people who come from what medium to our site convert the best. So in other words, is it people who see our links on Facebook, click on Facebook, read our articles, and then buy? Is it people who come every morning at 7 a.m., the same time every week, and then buy? Is it people from Twitter? Is it people from emails that are sent from their friends? Who are the types of people that are more likely to convert? Because once we know that, we know what our marketing teams inside of a newspaper need to spend more time on. So maybe, it, maybe it's Facebook. Maybe we, we see, as you know what, it's the people on Facebook who click more than once per week that end up converting. So guess what we need to do? We need to get more people to click once per week on Facebook to get them to convert. And so the more we track, the more we understand, the more users we can get there. So uh, speaking of tracking, there's lots of things that we track as it is for, for digital websites and, and newspaper websites, um, but I want to talk about a couple of things specific to uh, digital subscriptions. The first is a subscriber lifetime value. Um, this one is huge. What we're trying to do is we're trying to understand what is the value of a digital subscriber. So we know, and, and we've known for a while from a print uh, circulation standpoint, what the average value of a print subscriber is. But we now want to understand that for digital. So the easiest way to do that is to understand how long your average digital subscriber lasts based on your churn rate. What are they paying per month? That's their value. But you can also, you know, newspapers can also get more complex. And they can sit and look at, well, we know that people who come from uh, Facebook are last this long versus people who, who come from having a print subscription and downgrading, which actually happens very, very rarely, um, or from people who signed up via this type of a marketing campaign have this type of a value. We also can look at, and this is where it gets interesting, we also can look at, well, subscribers look at our site more, right? We know that. Well, more page views means more ad revenue. So what is the actual ad revenue impact of an additional subscriber? And we can start to understand these things and build in a model that lets us know, you know what? A subscriber is worth $225 to us over their lifetime. And that means that if I can spend $50 to get a subscriber, that's great. Or I can spend $100 to get a subscriber, and that's great too. And so we want to understand that number so that we can drive that the next number, which is our cost per acquisition. We want to understand how much does it cost to actually go after that member. And so that could be on a campaign basis, that could be overall. Um, again, you know, I, I told you before, Sirius was spending at the beginning over $100, $200 per subscriber. I don't think we'll be at that point. Um, but we're very easily at a point where we can spend $50 to $75 per subscriber and still be making more than our lifetime value. But a newspaper has to know that, understand that, and be comfortable about that before they're going to go out and spend $75 to go get a subscriber. And the last one is conversion rate. So that means the, 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 the overall landing page, and this is what most people are, are familiar with, is the idea of, okay, someone came to the page, what's their likelihood to convert? So people land on the paywall, we see 10% of them convert. Um, but we also can, again, drill down and look at by demographic, uh, by where they came from. So they come from Facebook, they come from Twitter, what is their conversion rate? Um, and why is this useful? Well, for two reasons. One, setting those newsroom goals, right? So if we know that, again, the conversion rate's high on local in-depth content, then you don't want to set a goal in the newsroom because it would be disastrous if you told the newsroom to, hey, increase our conversion rate. The newsroom's going to look at you and say, oh, what do I do with that? So instead, it's driving, okay, well, we know that here are the three content types that we see the highest conversion rate on. We want to produce more unique visitors accessing that type of content. Um, so it helps set those newsroom goals. And again, it's going to help understand what's behind the paywall. If you're getting a horrible conversion rate and newspapers saying, well, no one converts on breaking news and crime stories, well, why is it behind the paywall? Then it's not driving. Reduce the, number, the count on their paywall. So if it was at 10, bring it down to 5 or 8, but put the breaking news and crime stories in front of the paywall to get people to continue to access the content that they weren't willing to pay for anyway. 
So what are we working on with my fellowship project? The first is a, a member, membership acquisition platform. And so that's the idea of having uh, a platform that will look at who's visiting a website, who's visiting a newspaper website, and then going out and marketing to them. So based on what we know on keeping down that cost per acquisition to within a level that satisfies what the newspaper's requirements are, and actually marketing their subscription model. Um, Randy mentioned that uh, you know, a lot of them are, are, are doing marketing for their subscription model. The number one thing they're doing, rack cards, inserts in the newspaper, and sometimes telemarketing, but very rarely. Well, marketing your digital subscriptions to your newspaper customers is not necessarily the best way to drive digital subscriptions. Um, so we're actually going to take a lot of the learnings that we have from e-commerce, uh, from digital branding, and apply those tactics to newspapers to help them increase their subscription rates. Um, so we're running, uh, we've got two s newspapers signed up, uh, possibly a third uh, that will be running a trial here within the next month. Uh, to see how this platform works and how many subscribers we can drive for them. And then expanding into other areas that I talked about throughout the presentation, whether that's landing page optimization, A-B testing, all those different areas that newspapers need help with. We're also putting together best practices. So outside of just this, this presentation, uh, actually you know, solidifying here are the things that we know works from an e-commerce perspective and how you can employ those at, at the newspaper. So that may be uh, something as simple as the landing page optimization, uh, but it also may be, uh, you know, hey, you want to track your, your conversion rates? Here's how to do that in Google Analytics. And so we're, we want to put that information out there because we think that that's something that newspapers need to be doing. And, and, and really the big piece of what we're doing is we're trying to build a company that goes out there and can help newspapers with this second half. And it really, it's to me not just the second half, it's probably the second two-thirds, right? A lot of them say, we've got our paywall up. Yay, we hired this company that put the paywall up. We're doing great. Uh, we think that there's a lot more that can be done uh, from a marketing perspective to help them actually make this uh, a profitable venture and to actually have their digital website be a, a profitable company. Um, and so that's what we're, we're trying to build. So that's a little bit about that. I'll, we'll take any questions if folks have. I think we've got a microphone here that will, uh, if anybody has any questions. So um, I have a paid membership site, and um, one of the things that always boggles my mind is how to put all the data together. And um, I've looked at subscription site insiders' reports, and they say, you know, you should have this, and you should have this, and you should have this, and you should correlate it all, and lifetime value of the Facebook fan, all that. Have you figured? Whoops, have you figured out where where that? Are there software providers built from scratch? What, where the, are the front ends that will help you there put aren't, all that? So the, e the, the people in this space right now are mostly, and I call them this, they don't like the term, but they're e-commerce software companies, right? So they're the ones that actually put the paywall up. They'll track the user, they'll serve the messaging, they'll process the credit card. Um, they're the store. And so some of those stores will provide some of that data, right? So they'll come back and say, we're seeing this conversion rate. Um, but they, they stop short at really being uh, marketing agencies. Now, some of them are starting to get into that and to come back and say, okay, well, we, we've dived into the data and we've found that if you made these changes or these changes, you'd increase your revenue. They have a, 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 uh, an incentive to do that because most of them are making money per subscribers and the more subscribers they get, the more money they make. Um, but they're really usually looking at best practices. So they're one player that may, we may start seeing do more of that, and that's the e-commerce providers, and some of them are doing that. Um, but there really isn't anyone who's provided a reporting platform to take all of these subscription-based data and provide it back to the publishers. And so um, we're actually having some conversation with some folks about that, and does that make sense, and what does that look like? And, you know, it's also a matter of it's, it's, a, it's a customized thing, right? So it's not one size fits all. And then just providing people data doesn't do them any good. We actually have to provide them with how to act on it. And so there's definitely a, a need for it and a possibility that that may be something that we, we look at building out. Um, as a librarian, I'm coming after this at a, a different angle, I guess. I'm thinking in terms of um, marketing. It looks like you're marketing to just a very, very small uh, segment people that actually have certain individual devices that actually hit the site 
whereas newspapers have these this an enormous amount of of audiences that are being left out. I mean, they're not being thought of, and and I'm also wondering. You know, newspapers need to go out and find out exactly what some of these um, other audiences need because not everyone has a smartphone, an iPad. We have left out, as we go online only, we've left out huge audiences. We've left out public library audiences. We've left out all of our academic library audiences too. And so there's no way we can offer some of these these products because they are personal products, one-to-one, -one, a product to a device. Um, it would be really nice if newspapers would think about m all of the multiple audiences that they have and like for instance, let's say New York Times right now, we have two print subscriptions, they give it to us free because they haven't figured out how to monetize an enterprise subscription. Newsweek went online only. We can't get um, another, uh, you know, a subscription for multiple folks, but we pay $24.95 and we're giving it to everybody. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's a, I mean, there are multiple audiences out there and I'm just trying to figure out, have newspapers, when will they figure that situation I, I, out? I, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I, I think that it, it kind of goes, remember in the middle when I said we could have the two-day session on, on products? That's what they're, 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 we're missing. Because what we've, we, we do with newspapers is we say, for the longest time we print, printed this paper seven days a week. We threw it on people's doorsteps or they could buy a single copy, but we made our money throwing it on people's doorsteps. And so how do we take that and move that online? And we've always asked that question versus saying, okay, we've got a unique set of resources, which is a newsroom, and we've got an audience, which is this, what do they want that we can provide, whether it be digital, mobile, print, you know, fax machine, whatever it might be, what's the product they're looking for? And so I think we're seeing some newspapers having that conversation. I think the, the biggest problem is that uh, anything is perceived as a potential threat to the print product. And why I spent most of the presentation, and I, and I always talk about uh, digital subscriptions, is because you know, when I say, when I talk to a, a, a publisher and they say, oh yeah, we launched our, our, our digital subscription product. Oh, well, how's it going? Great, we've increased our print subscription. Because that's what they care about. All they care about right now, and you know, you can blame them or not blame them, is increasing that number because they've got revenue goals, they've got subscription goals that they have to meet, and that's the easiest and quickest and shortest way for them to get there, but it doesn't play out well long term. And so to your point, I think they need to start thinking about what are the products we offer uh, that makes sense. And I'll give you a, a great example that, 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 that we, we've, we've been talking about, which is snowbirds. For people in Florida, for, for newspapers in Florida, that's a huge audience. And right now they leave and guess what they do? They put a stop on their paper and that paper gets no money. And so the reality is newspapers, either on their own, should be providing snowbird-based subscriptions that give them digital access or potentially partnering with the Northern Papers and saying, look, you always get digital access to both and you get to pick which print product you get. But instead, we're focused right now, unfortunately, on the short term of how can I make a quick buck by charging a digital subscription. So I think, I think that'll change and we'll start to see newspapers innovate. Um, but you know, they're gonna go out and figure out what, where's the audience and where's, where's the money. And that's, that's what they're looking at right now. So, great question. So sort of a, a follow-up on that, could you, could you walk us through an example of how um, on a digital side a, a newspaper could go advertise on other sites because I think they're all good about advertising on their own site but they haven't, it hasn't occurred to them that there's a lot of other sites they could advertise on. Walk us through how that kind of smart prospecting might work on, sure. a, uh, on a site that's not their own. Sure, so w what we do, uh, the first thing we do is we, I we identify people to the site. So we, we take a look at the newspaper.com, as we call it, the newspaper.com, and identify everyone who visits the site. And then we identify the people who are subscribers because they have to log in to view the content if they're subscribers, so we know who the subscribers are. So we, we kind of remove those people from our targeting group. So now we've got you know, thousands of people that are within their market, view their content on a regular basis, but aren't subscribers because they don't hit the threshold. Or when they do hit the threshold, they just don't come back till tomorrow. Or they clear their cookies. They do a number of other things. Um, we look at those people. 
and then we go out and we target them with ads on other sites. So there's ad exchanges and ad networks that allow us to purchase ads on other websites. So that could be, they could be on ESPN.com, they could be on another local news site, um, they could be on you know, some DIY website, uh, it really doesn't matter, it could be a local blogger, or a national blogger, or an entertainment site, um, and what we do is we start serving ads. So our, our system uh, does kind of a random sampling and starts serving these ads and says, okay, you know, the ad will say, you know, have a, have a message to drive them to a subscription. And what the system does is it looks to see what works. And they'll say, okay, what we saw is people who fit into this category on these sites ended up purchasing at this rate, and it costs us this, and so we know that we can keep that cost per acquisition under the goal mark. Um, or it'll say, you know what, people didn't convert, and so only, you know, one in a million people convert, and so therefore it would cost us way too much money if we served ads on that site to those people, and so it'll stop serving ads. And so it goes through what we call an optimized phase, where it starts learning what works, and when it hits that threshold, um, it'll go into its full-fledged marketing. So it'll know on this sliver of inventory on the internet, people will, op will buy a subscription to that site, and so we're gonna serve ads to almost everyone, and we'll pay this rate because it makes sense. And so it continually is doing that and optimizing and learning to figure out where to go after and serve ads to people. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that is being done every day on the internet with a variety of other products. So when you go to zappos.com, and you shop for shoes, and then the next week you, all you see are Zappos ads, that's because they know that all they gotta do is serve those ads. And even though you may not convert, enough people convert that it was worth it to them to serve all those ads. Um, most e-commerce companies deploy these tactics on a regular basis. They've got teams of people doing it, uh, whether it's at an agency or in-house, and so we're helping newspapers to do exactly that. Um, and then the other benefit is that we're gonna learn what works for sub sub subscribers. So while every market's different, we're already seeing, we know we're gonna see that there are certain things that, okay, we know these are the type of sites that work well, this is the type of messaging that works well, this is what type of landing page works well, and we're gonna be able to help them uh, optimize that without even wasting money, if you will, or spending money on the learn process of, of it. So. Yeah, I don't know if we've got it. It seemed like it was only a couple of years ago, uh, the mantra was, you can't get people to pay for news. Uh, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, especially if young people have been brought up on free information. So what's changed so radically in the last couple of years? Is it just wishful thinking on behalf of the publishers that they're moving towards the, this 50% uh, paid, or, is it, or has there been some kind of appalling conversion going on here? Which uh, the reason, it, uh, so there's, there's two pieces, right? One is, uh, ha has the mindset changed? And is that why publishers' mindset changed, right? So there's the consumer mindset and the publisher mindset. Uh, the publisher mindset, in my opinion, has very little to do with whether or not the consumer mindset changed and has everything to do with the fact that some newspapers got desperate, they were willing to try it, they tried it, and they saw success. And so we love in the publishing industry to point over there and say, hey, they made a buck, we can do that too. And so that's exactly what's happening, that's fine. I do think that the consumer mindset is changing, um, but I think it's also fairly easy to change it. I mean, if we spent, whether as an industry or as an individual paper, we spent marketing dollars, you can change someone's mindset. I mean, that's not impossible. Um, the other piece is that this idea that, well, you'll always just be able to go get that content somewhere else, that's not always the case. And I think there, there's more realization of that. You know, my, my brother, who's younger, called me today, and he actually had no clue that this is what I've been working on. And we were talking, and he said, he knew that I used to work at the Sentinel, and said, I hate that they're charging me for content now. I said, okay, and we went through the whole process, and I said, well, well, what, clearly you're looking at, a, he said, I don't even look at a lot. I said, well, clearly you're looking at a lot of content. If you're, I know what they're paying, well, that's at 10, and so obviously you're looking at more than 10 articles a month, and what's ha And we went through this whole process to where, and, and his mind all of a sudden said, well, fine, I'm just gonna buy the paper then. <laughs> like, I'll show them, I'm not gonna pay for their, I'm not gonna pay for their website, I'll buy the paper. You know, so, and that's only one case, I'm not saying that's, but, but it, you know, it's a mindset that yes has to change, but I think we as an industry or as an individual paper can change that mindset. Um, and that's about marketing. And so, you know, I pulled up the Chicago Tribune, they call it membership. Uh, in South Carolina, uh, in Charleston, they call it membership. LA Times, it's a membership. Um, and why? Because they're trying to change, you know, okay, you're not gonna pay to be a digital subscriber, but maybe you'll pay to be a local member. Um, AOL still has tons of people subscribing to their internet access, not for internet access, but because of all the other bells and whistles you get when you're an AOL member. Um, and I'm not talking email, it's, you know, they do antivirus, they've got warranty programs, they've got all these other things that get people in and they stick. Um, there are a number of YMCA's that have a, a very low usage rate 
much lower than most gyms, but people still con continue to be members of the YMCA. Now, they feel like they're doing something good for the community, they understand their other benefit, you know, what are the things that newspapers can start packaging and bundling together outside of the core product? In South Carolina, they do, they do tons of, member, of events. Um, and so I think there's a, the mindset need, it's a marketing problem, right? And so when it's a marketing problem, we need to think about it that way, and it's a product problem. So what is the product that we're offering? Is it just, hey, we're giving you seven day a week subscri subscription, or are we giving you a digital membership? There's actually a, 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 a great piece, which is that digital members have a lower churn rate. So the idea that when someone is going to unsubscribe, they're more likely to unsubscribe to a newspaper, printed paper, than they are from the digital product. And that just seems odd when you think about it at face value. In one case, you're getting something. You're getting a physical product, and, the, and you get the digital product, too. In the other case, you're just getting the digital product. And we're talking not like, oh, it's a couple percentage points off, drastic differences. And a lot of that is reminder, right? Every day, if you subscribe to paper, you're getting a reminder that I've got this paper that I'm paying for. It's going in the recycling bin if I'm not reading it. Um, so what is, what is the usage that people are, what are they using it for? Maybe it's OK that somebody is paying to be a digital member, and all they do is every Friday find out what the community events are. They're okay with that. They're not being reminded every day that I'm paying for this product. And so I think it's changing that mindset, changing that understanding of what is a subscriber, what is a member, um, that, ha that is going to drive it forward. Uh, it's not going to be shoveling the print product to digital subscribers. Um, we made a huge mistake in the industry when we first launched websites. We said, we're going to take our, our newspaper and we're going to put it online. And we said we'd offer it for free, and that's great. Um, but we literally shoveled it, and, and so the zoo has, has spent years teaching journalism students that uh, you can't just shovel your content from the newspaper on the web. You've got to do different things with it. You have to market it. It's a different product. It's a different user. It's a different user experience. And then we go and we launch subscriptions, and we say, we're going to take our print subscriptions, and we're going to shovel them on the web, and we're going to offer the same thing. And it's not. We've got to think about it differently. And so that's that marketing mindset that has to change. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.